Right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. Uh, today, I am uh, fortunate to have Barbara Lizette Sanchez on, and we're going to talk about her fascinating story. So a little bit about her. She's an absolute rock star in the publicist world, and one of her biggest passions in life is you know, sponsoring single mothers and ladies that have been in, I guess, victims of domestic assaults and domestic violence, and so that's something that's very near and dear to her heart, but her story is going to take us from McDonald's to red carpet events to being featured in Forbes articles. So uh, yeah, you know, we're going to get through this in less than an hour, I promise. Uh, but yeah, her story is very fascinating. So Barbara, thanks so much for being on today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here with you today, this beautiful Friday. <laughs> Absolutely. So well, good. So I want to kick it off in your younger years. Um, you are quoted as saying, you know, even at the age of five years old, you knew you wanted to sing and dance and be on TV someday. So talk a little bit about where that excitement and the thrill of that came from for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was uh, five and I was uh, I was born and raised in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. So uh, the possibilities of me being on TV were very slim to none <laughs> <laughs> at that time because my mom was always taking care of us. My dad used to come here to the States and work. Um, so it was my mom and my siblings. So, but when I was five, I used to watch, uh, you know, all the celebrities on TV, movies and stuff like that. And I was like, I'm going to be there one day. I'm going to work with them. And, you know, I, was, I used to go and tell my mom what she was cooking on the kitchen. And my mom used to look at me like, yeah, sure. You know, pat my head a little bit and be like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> go back to playing with your dolls over there. And so, yeah, that's how I develop a passion for, um, for the entertainment business, I guess you could say. Absolutely. So uh, a pivotal moment comes at 15. As you mentioned, you grew up in Mexico, but then uh, you make the, the move away from Mexico to the United States. So talk a little bit about that, because that's an interesting story. Yeah, definitely. So it all started because my dad, my dad actually where I get all my, I guess, uh, you know, hustling mentality and, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, comes from my dad because you know he has his own business and everything so my dad was like you know what I believe that we can make a bit you know a better life out there you know let's just move the family and and see what we can do my mom was totally opposed to it my mom did not want us to move because <laughs> all, of, all of, of her family obviously uh, was in Mexico and is still in Mexico to this day okay um, but long story short, so um, my dad said, well, you know, let's just try it out for a year. If it doesn't work out, you know, and then he promised us to go to go to Disneyland too. He's like, oh, for your 15th birthday, well, I'll take you to Disneyland. He totally lied. <laughs> he never did. <laughs> hey, dad, dad. Till this day, he still hasn't taken me to Disneyland, okay? <laughs> we'll we'll let him know that he needs to go ahead and get, get on yeah, that too. I'm like, dad, hello. It's been 20 plus years now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh so yeah so um so when we got here obviously it was a, a a culture shock because i didn't speak the language i did not know what in the world was going on with anyone i was like oh my god what what's all this you know yeah. and obviously i was a no i was a sophomore um in in high school so it was really challenging to adjust so Absolutely. So yeah, one thing that you mentioned there, and I think it's important was you said, you know, I think my some of my work ethic, I learned from my dad, talk a little just about the impact that you know, his work ethic had on you and what you were able to see growing up. Yeah, absolutely. So my dad was kind of like a rebel. Uh, you know, <laughs> Oh, man, it rubbed off on you. It totally did. In a good way, actually. Yeah. And, you know, my mom saw it as a negative. Um, oh. I took it as a positive because my dad was always like, you know, quitting the, the regular nine to fives and, and kind of like rebelling against them and saying, no, 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 I can make something out of, you know, of, of something else. I don't need to work for anyone, anyone else's dreams. And my mom used to be like, well, we got to pay rent. We got to pay bills. We, what are you thinking? Oh my God. And so I understood, I understood where my mom was coming from at that time, but now it makes a lot of sense to what my dad kind of rebel against it. Yeah. And now we're, you know, now we're in a space where he's been a street vendor for 20 plus years and hasn't worked with, you know, for anybody. Yeah. Years. So that's where all my um, entrepreneurial, you know, uh, side comes from because my dad used to take me door to door when I was five 
uh, when I was 10, I'm sorry, when I was 10, um, selling, uh, so, you know, cleaning supplies. And he was like, you gotta, you gotta hustle. You gotta convince people. You gotta sell and you gotta do yeah. that. So I was like, okay. And, you know, and, and in Mexico, it was like, it was an era where we wouldn't have to worry about kidnappers or, you know, people or pedophiles or things like that right. at that age. I mean, we did, but, you know, not as bad, you know, and the yeah. back of the 90s, it wasn't as bad as it is today. And yep. so, you know, I used to go by myself and yeah. the neighborhood used to know me and they were like, oh, here comes Barbara. Like, yeah, find <laughs> something. You know, like, I think I used to sell those buckets for like uh, two, three dollars. You know, it's just yeah. super insanely cheap. Well, your dad's a smart man to use a cute 10 year old to, you know, be selling products. That, that's a smart <laughs> entrepreneurial man right there. Yeah, my dad used to take me and people were like, oh, but then there were people that used to actually shut the door in our faces too. But like, what do you know what the heck? Don't be knocking at my door. And was like, oh my God. So we got a little bit of everything. <laughs> well, you learned no at an early age. That's a good thing. That ends up being important in your line of work. Yes, that's correct. Now that I look at it, you know, like I said, my mom used to look, look at that as a negative. And mm -hmm. I actually, now that, that I'm an adult, I started understanding that that was actually a positive thing for me. Absolutely. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. I don't want to work for anybody. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. So you're in the United States, you're going to high school here in the States and you, you have this friend, Adam, and uh, he, he proves to be an important person in a first venture for you. So you and Adam get connected into a clothing line. Talk a little bit about this experience and what it was entailing. Okay, you, you're good. You did your research. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, going, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Usually people ask me, you know, how you get started and I tell them the story, but you, you went right in. I, I love it. <laughs> Okay, Adam. Um, yeah, Adam is a good friend of mine till this day. He became my mentor too. And he introduced me to um, a gentleman named Anthony. He used to have this clothing line called Devilish. And at that time, it was super popular. Yeah. Um, and that was my first um, experience of the Hollywood and human business. Yeah. Um, because he was, you know, he was uh, throwing fashion shows and scouting models and putting together all this great events. So I actually started doing sales for them and I ended up making a lot of sales, a lot of great things. And he was very impressed. So he started, you know, pulling, pulling me in a little bit more, but then I kind of noticed that, you know, he was also kind of like taking advantage of a little. So, yeah, you know, that's the taste you get when you're new, you know, people yeah. do take, you know, take advantage and that's okay. That taught me a lot. So I was like, okay. Uh, but yeah, so Adam actually is the one that, um, encouraged me because we were both from the same hometown um Oxnard, california so um he was like you know what let's just get out of this little town there's nothing to do here we love Oxnard. don't get me wrong 805 yeah. all the way but <laughs> but you know as far as you know opportunities there's really nothing there to do you know so yeah. we understood that we had to get out of there and move to los angeles so um so i said you know what let's just do that and so yeah i mean not to get off topic but Adam was very instrumental in my, in my, uh, you know, up, upcoming um, years as a publicist. <laughs> yeah. Well, so uh, we're, we're going to age ourselves here, but uh, for, as you are pivoting out of this role, you start using MySpace to, uh, to do some recruiting for fashion shows. So <laughs> for anyone that's too young, don't worry about it. It was, you know, uh, Facebook before MySpace. Facebook was as big as it is, but talk yeah. a little bit about that. Cause that's a very entrepreneurial thing to have done at that age. Yeah, definitely. MySpace is the is the is the the, the social platform that that got me off. Like basically, like everybody knew me because of MySpace, and I became super popular on that app. Yeah. And thanks to Adam, because uh, also Adam is a is a web designer. So MySpace, as we know, some of you know, some of you don't know, but it was super like uh, hip because you could you could actually decorate your page and and play music and do this and that i mean just add a little touch of your personality there yeah. and so adam used to be really good at that at decking my page you know my page and and super cool it used to look super cool <laughs> so i was like oh yay so a lot of people were like oh my god barbara you know and and that's why you know adam actually uh like you know stressed to me presentation is everything yeah well presentation is a must it's number one so that's where I started getting that mentality because I was very, I was rough around the edges when I started. I mean, I was posting horrible pictures and like, 
<laughs> you know, all of this uh, like stuff that was not acceptable. And he was like, no, you cannot do that. Take that off. And I was like, oh my God, okay. <laughs> it took me a minute to actually get, you know, to where I am today. But uh, thanks to Adam, he, you know, he helped me a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you, you move from, you know, your hometown of California or in California and uh, get more into the Hollywood and you know, I guess bigger scene, if you will. And I'm sure there's a lot of different things that happen there. But what's one of the first memories for you as you had moved there that really got your foot in the door into the, you know, I guess, upper echelon of, you know, people and then publicity? Yeah, well, actually, I didn't move right away. It okay. took me about 10 years later to move to LA. I still, I was still living in Oxnard. Um, but uh, one of the first experiences that I got is I got to meet a lot of famous comedians and actors. So one experience that I have is meeting another one of my uh, mentors at the moment, Eric Sully. He is also a publicist and he helped me a lot. I mean, he was like, you know what? You're the female version of me. Why don't you become a publicist? And I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> he was like, well, you're already talking to people. You're already, you know, organizing stuff. You might as well. And I was like, okay, that sounds easy. Yeah, right. It wasn't even, <laughs> you know, half of what I was, what I'm doing now. Yeah, but, right. um, yeah, but the first experience that I had was meeting Omar Benson Miller which is a good friend of mine now. He's now a, su a superstar. Back in the day, he still was. He was on um, Eminem's um, uh, Get Rich, no, what is it? Um, Eight Mile, sorry. And yeah. 50 Cent's Get Rich on Train. And then he yeah. did Michael Sanana. So he was, he was already popping back then. But now he's on Ballers. He's on The Unicorn. He's on right. everywhere. Yeah. I'm so proud of him. So that was my first encounter of meeting Omar. And then obviously I was doing, uh, and then I met Cypress Hill the you know the rappers yeah and I started doing uh ticket sales for them and I yeah. started you know just going out and um going to the walls and be like oh my god I work for you know be real and so and so and buy the tickets and yeah it was it was crazy <laughs> well so I want to get to the story of starting to sell those tickets but there's one story I'd like to hear a little bit more of because I think yeah. It's kind of a mixture of what you were talking about earlier, of learning no, but learning how to overcome things. And you got invited to a party at the mansion. Oh, And yes. you're told that you got to get up to a certain level. And I want to hear that because Wait, there's a lot of know? resilience. Oh my God, you are so good. Okay, whoa, this is scaring me now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Yes. So Be the Dragon uh, was a really good friend of mine. I haven't heard from him in like, I don't know how many years now, but he is cousins with Reza from Gutang and, you know, all these people. Yeah. And so um, he's, yeah, he's, he's very connected to them. Um, so he was, he became a, my mentor too. And at that time I was like, this dude's super crazy. He's out of his mind. What is he doing? Like, <laughs> Like he had tattoos all over his face and, yeah. you know, people used to gravitate towards him so organically. He was yeah. like a magnet. Everybody wanted to be around him. And I always wonder why I was like, why, why does it make, you know, why is he so special? What makes him so special? I mean, I know it's the tattoos on his face too, but, yeah. but let alone it was his personality. So anyway, so he invited me to the mansion and the mansion at that moment back in 2007 or six was like the a major um club in hollywood like that was like the yeah you know that was that number one like everybody yeah. wanted to be in there it was super popular so um it had actually three stories and in, in the first one was like you know the people that used to go clubbing only then the second one i think it was just like you know the the high end and the third level was like the super a-lister so like that was the best of the best yeah so i was like okay so he was like he started teaching me like you gotta put your celebrity game on and you gotta believe in yourself and when you get there i'm gonna be there on friday so i'll see you there and i was like okay cool you're gonna come down and get me he's like no <laughs> and i'm like what do you mean no he's like yeah. no you gotta get yourself out there you will make it and you are gonna believe in yourself and i'll see you there and i was like are you kidding me <laughs> So I just, you know, I just pulled up to the club and uh, the first security guard was there, the bodyguards and the bodyguards were super mean and like they did not give a damn about who, 
<laughs> you didn't know anybody. Yeah. But, you know, that night I actually thought about everything that he taught me and that we talked about. And I just put it on my head. You know, I said, I am an A-lister. I am a celebrity too. I deserve to be here. I'm going to make it. And so I actually talked to the first bodyguard and the first bodyguard was like, who are you with? And I was like, oh, I'm going to go see, you know, the dragon. I mean, of course I didn't use his name because I was like, <laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah. And he was like, he said, hold on. And then he went back and so I don't know who he talked to. And he's like, okay, go ahead and name, uh, go to the second, whatever. And I was like, oh, I'm like, all right, I passed this. <laughs> so I went up to the second floor yeah. and then there was more security, obviously. And I was like, oh, Lord Jesus. So I just went in there and, you know, I was very confident. And I was like, hey, I'm here, you know, to go to the third floor to see my friend. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So this other bodyguard was looking at me. And then they obviously they, he went and talked to everybody else. And then I don't know what the hell they said. And they were like, okay, let's let her in. That's fine. I was like, oh, my God, one more. <laughs> then finally, when they get to the last one, uh, I see him actually sitting down, you know, on uh, with all the VIPs and all the people and I'm like I'm like oh my god I'm here and I'm trying to be like hey but he, he ignored me so hard oh and man like you know but he wanted me to you know do that so yep. I was like okay and then I just you know the bodyguard this bodyguard was huge he was so intimidating I was like oh my god I don't know if, I, if I'm gonna do this I don't know how and then finally you know he saw me and he was like okay fine and then the bodyguard's like hold on let me see who you are let me and then he's like okay that she's fine she's fine let her in and i was like oh my god <laughs> and i'm like going super fast with the story because honestly yeah. like every level that i got you know that i started climbing it was so nerve-wracking i'm like yeah. oh my god am i gonna get kicked out am i gonna <laughs> Yeah. Well, and so I, I asked about that story, not because everyone needs to hear about how you got into some club, right? I mean, you know, that, that is what it is. But more right. so, I, you know, reflecting on that, right? I mean, those those bodyguards in the levels are, are eerily similar to what we go through in life, right? Hey, I get through that first stage and I'm like, whoo, all right, I made it through that one. Right. All right, now I'm on to the next one, right? And to get to the pinnacle of your career, your game, whatever it is that you're doing, it takes getting through those levels and it's hard. And there's not always someone there that's going to like help you get through it. Uh, but if you have confidence, you can get through it. So maybe talk a little bit about how that instilled confidence in you moving forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, well that injected like a major dose of confidence because once I was able to prove to myself and brainwash myself into really believing in myself, I was like, oh you know after that it hit me and I was like oh, wow like I could really believe in myself and really make everyone else believe in me and yeah. really know what I'm worth you know right. and and this was incredible to me because you know due to my history of domestic violence and everything that I I went through before prior to that um, my confidence was not, you know, my, my self-esteem was very low. I didn't love myself enough. So therefore, you know, I wasn't attracting the right thing. Right. But once I understood my worth and my value, oh my God, everything changed like that. Mm. People started gravitating towards me. People just wanted me to be at their events, throw their events, you know, yeah. be at, you know, whatever. Like people just were totally uh, contacting me on my space. Like, oh my God, Barbara, we want you here. Oh my God, Barbara, can you represent us? Oh my God. Da, da, da. And I was like, yeah. whoa. <laughs> yeah. Like, so, what is going on? So I want to ask you about that. Um, I think a lot of times we don't, we don't even necessarily realize we have a low self esteem or a low confidence level uh, until somebody shows us that or until we see having high confidence. So talk a little bit about that for you. I know you said, Hey, I struggled with, you know, not having a ton of confidence. Did you notice that in that moment? Or was that something that someone pointed out to you? Is it something later on you were able to look back and say, Oh, I didn't have confidence or talk a little bit about that. So it's interesting to talk about this because when I was in Mexico, I was super confident. I was yeah. a little girl that was like going for everything, talking in front of people. I did not care whatsoever. Yeah. But once I got here, I became so self-conscious about, uh -huh. you know, about who I was as a, as a person, because I, I believe one of the reasons why was because of the language, you know, I was afraid yeah. of people making fun of me. 
and yep. mispronouncing things, right? And so yep. I, I believe that was number one. Number two, I feel that uh, when I when I got involved with my, you know, with this person that, you know, that put me through hell and back, yeah, um, that had a lot to do with it as well. I, I believe that was the, you know, the cherry on top and be like, okay, well, this is, I lost my confidence and I lost myself in that process. And so I believe that, you know, when I, um, when I found out that I, that I didn't have the confidence anymore, I feel that that's when my, I met my friend, Evelina, Evelina was a, a, well, she is a psychologist. She's a therapist. Okay. And it's so crazy how, you know, um, you know, how, how life works because I was going through all these things and I met her in college. Right. I met her in college, but, you know, we talked, we hung out, but then we kind of went our separate ways, yeah. right, for a minute. And then it wasn't until I got married and I was going through all this chaos when she actually reappeared in my life. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, like, this is incredible. You know, God works in mysterious ways. You bet. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. So she's the one that started pointing it out because I was still very blind. Yeah. I was still in denial about things. She was like. Barbara, she's like, what is it going to take for you to break out of this relationship? And you're an incredible person, but you're still with this man. You are not going to go anywhere if you continue with him. And I cannot tell you how many times this woman told me that. And I would not listen. I would like, no, 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 because you still believe that you can change this person, right? That you, yeah. could, you know, that you could do something for them or save them from whatever it is they're going through. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it took me eight years to finally break out of that. And it was thanks to her because she started giving me therapy and she even said, let me give you guys couples therapy, you know, and she's like, but in the process, you're going to find out if you really want this man or not. Yeah. And sure enough, uh, I think it was the third month of, of, of us going through therapy when I, it's like a blindfold was removed from my eyes. And I was like, whoa, it's like waking up from a nightmare. I was yeah. like, oh my God, I really don't need this man. I don't need any man to treat me like this. What am I doing? Like, I just feel like I wanted to slap myself in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, what are you doing? Oh my God. It was yeah. horrific to actually, um, you know, come back to reality and, yeah. and realize everything that I have done and put myself through. Yeah. Well, who knew in the moment when you met her in college that she would end up being a catalyst to success, right? Oh my God. Yeah. That, and that's what I'm saying. It's incredible how life and God works. Yeah. You know? it, it's incredible. Absolutely. So now I want to fast forward to where, well, rewind to fast forward to what you had mentioned earlier. So you get on with Cypress Hill and, you know, once again, you're getting an opportunity to represent a big name and they say, all right, we need you to go sell tickets. So, I mean, once again, I'm seeing a parallel. Dad says, hey, I need you to sell things door to door. And now you're getting a chance to sell tickets. Talk a little bit about that experience and how having the confidence helped with that. Yeah, that that is super crazy to me. That's like a, yeah, it's like a full circle there because, yeah. you know, I wasn't shy, you know, yeah. to go door to door. I mean, I already had the experience when I was little. So it wasn't actually super hard for me to do the same. And actually during that time, during that period of time too, I was working at a, a, a Los Angeles Times selling a newspaper. So then I already knew how to convince people to buy. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, you gotta be a hustler selling that newspaper. I was gonna say, that's a tough job. <laughs> oh my God, it is. And I used to be the top seller there. I used to like snap my fingers because you have a headset. And I used to be like, hey, they're ready to pay, they're ready to pay. So your floor manager used to come to you and then you know they will like actually take the information for them to pay. But going back to that, so when I met Cypress Hill, I met, I actually met uh, Mel Menace, which is the godfather of Latin hip hop. And he's the one that founded Cypress Hill because he is um, uh, Sandog's uh, brother. So, you know, they're related. So uh, when I met Melo, uh, he saw a lot of potential. And me and Mel Menace actually met through MySpace. Okay. Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> but we met through MySpace and... Uh, and at that time, I had this notorious name. Like, you know, I was still going through my identity process. So yeah. my MySpace was infamous baby girl. I don't know what the hell got into me too. <laughs> <laughs> Those are fun. Those are like your Hotmail accounts, right? You're oh like, my, please never oh, find these. Please, please never, never find, find these. Those. Oh my God. It was so embarrassing. It's so embarrassing nowadays. But you know, that's 
part of who I was. I was still lost and, you know, whatever. So uh, it's so funny because we met at the Rainbow. It's a very famous uh, bar in uh, in um, Sunset Boulevard. It's very iconic next to the whiskey. Okay. And um, so, yeah, those, those are very iconic venues. And so anyway, so uh, we met at the Rainbow and uh, when I'm getting, when I'm arriving to meet him, he goes, he goes, infamous? And I'm like, Melo? And he's like, yeah, oh my God, it is so funny. And to this day, I still remember clearly how we met. So we sat down, we had a couple of drinks, we had, you know, something to eat and Adam was with me. I took Adam with me because Adam was my right hand man and yeah. my mentor. So, uh, so we met, you know, and then um, after that, you know, Mel was like, hey, why don't you help me with, you know, concerts? You know, we have a lot of tickets to sell. Like, why don't I give you some tickets, see what you can do and you can help us like that. And you can also get your, you know, some of the experience on working with musicians. And I said, oh, that's perfect. Hell yeah. And, you know, yeah. I looked up to Melo because, you know, I listened to his music too. And uh, obviously Cypress Hill. And I was like, I was a big fan too. And I was like, yeah. oh, of course. So when we met Be Real was like, whoa, like it was incredible because I listened to all those people in high school, right? So to work with them now, it's also real. Yeah. And so when I met uh, Melo and Sand Dog and, you know, everybody on, on Cyprus, I was like, oh my God, they were like, yeah, go sell the tickets. We have a concert, uh, the whiskey on whatever day. So we need to sell the tickets. And it wasn't just about 50 or or a hundred, it was 500 and some, okay? It was a big amount of tickets. It wasn't yeah. just like, oh yeah, go ahead and see what you can do with this 50. Hell no, it was like 500 <laughs> to 600. <laughs> so, like, and I think I had a week, a period of a week or less than a week to get rid of them. Wow. So what I did, uh, because I used to go to the malls, obviously the malls are, you know, pop in, there's a lot yeah. of young kids and, you know, people that are into that type of music. So, and yeah. I knew the demographics, so I was very, um strategic with it so i was like okay i'm gonna sell it to this i'm gonna sell it to that and i knew their demographics were like kind of like you know 30 to well probably 25 to 45 years old because that's you know that's my general it's my generation so i was like yeah. okay you know let's let's do that so anyways i started selling all kinds of tickets and stuff and people sometimes were questioning that's it this is how i you know how i'm gonna get to the second part of this because yeah. people were like are you sure you're part of this? You know, are you, do you, do you know them? Yeah. Are you sure you're just lying? Like, no, I'm not going to buy that. Cause you know, that they, they thought they were counterfeit. Like, Oh no, this right. is going to get our money. Yeah. And I had no way to prove it except for, you know, my space messages or yeah, yeah. messages <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Or sometimes I had to call Melo and be like, can you talk to them? But of course I didn't want to bug him all the time. Cause he right. was busy. So I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. I, I, I proposed this to Melo and I said, Melo, can you please make me a jacket? A jacket, yes. My name. <laughs> and I said, you know, so that way I look more credible and people don't question me. Uh-huh. And it's so incredible how that works because once I put that jacket on, not only did that give me the com- more confidence to go out there, it solidified what I was, what I was, you know, pitching and what I was selling. Yes. So when people used to look at me they, they went and looked at the, the logo, the name. They're like, oh, yeah, she's legit. She's, you know, she's, she's uh, yeah, she's part of the crew. So they used to buy like 10 tickets at a time, then 15, then, you know, oh, well, give me one for my cousin and give me one for this. And I'm like, yeah, it's going to be super cool. Get there early, blah, blah, blah. You know, I used to hype it up. And so, um, yeah, the next thing you know, I only had like one or two tickets in my pocket. And I was like, oh, shoot, I sold them all. Oh, my God. And then I used to drive from Oxnard to Hollywood to LA. Yeah. On Sir Boulevard. And that's an hour and 30 minute drive. So every single time we had a concert <laughs> and the traffic was horrible. And oh, I can only like, imagine. Yeah. He's like, Barb, where are you at? Because I was the most important person because I will have the money. Yeah. So they used to have to, you know, break the money and, and pay everybody out, out of that. So I used to have to go so the promoters will have the money on hand. And then after that, everybody used to get paid and then the show will go on. And that's when I got to relax. I was like, oh my God. But it was constant hustling with those concerts. Yep. So. Absolutely. So that's such a neat story. Now there becomes another important person in your life and you meet a gal named Patricia. Yes. And she becomes a, a mentor, a partner, however you want to look at. So talk a little bit about how the two of you got connected and what took off from there. 
Well, Patty, Patty actually is my current business partner, and yeah. I, I just met her, um, I'm going to say two years ago, actually. Yeah. Uh, we met at this concert because I represent uh, Raz B from the from the boy band B2K. Yeah. And so <clears throat> Raz and I have been friends for about 20 plus years. We know each other forever. And there was a, a rewind concert, right? A 90s concert that, they, that Patty uh, was in charge of because she works for Bobby D Presents, which is one of my clients now, uh, thanks to Patty, obviously. And uh, so... I reached out to Patty and I said, hey, uh, can me and, you know, my client attend the, the concert, blah, blah, blah. And because, you know, this is all the people that he knows and yeah. this is our, you know, genre of music anyways and our, you know, generation. So we're like, okay. And so anyway, so she said, yes, of course, I can give you guys two wristbands and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But knowing Raz, <laughs> he likes to all, always bring a bunch of people with him or, you know, some people just, <laughs> themselves without letting me know and I'm like gotta love that so I was like oh okay so the night you know he had about four people with him and I was like who are all these people again yeah <laughs> like well you know this is on song this is da, 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 and you know if we can go and and make it happen and you know you know you you can you can work your magic and I'm like oh okay <laughs> I'm like, great. So, you know, I, I hate to be put in those situations. But I like, can imagine. Yeah. Oh God, it's so crazy. And I'm just like, Ugh. so anyways, um, we get to the venue and Patricia comes out and I'm like, Hey, and you know, we meet each other with us the first time meeting, uh, meeting each other in person. So she was super kind and nice. And she's like, Oh my God. And what, but when I told her, I said, listen, I have rest, but I have five no four other people with us like is that okay she's like oh my gosh she gave me that face like no you didn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you and I was like I'm so sorry I swear I'll make it up to you I apologize I just you know whatever you can do at that point I was like you know what I'm not responsible for everybody else like yeah right I'm you know I'm here for my client and friends so if he wants to come in and enjoy himself you know so be it so she said no 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 hold on but she made it happen She's mm -hmm. like, you know what? Hold on, let me let me go. But please let this be the last time. And I said, no, no, no. I swear it'll be the last yeah. time ever. So she was running around like a crazy person, and then she comes out with the with the wristbands, and then so we're like, we're, we'll go in and have a great time. And then me and her just clicked after that. You know, we're like, oh my god, we need to keep in touch. And I just thank her so much for everything. And and then she, uh, you know, she started plugging me in with with Bobby D Presents, which is one of the yeah. biggest promoters we have here in LA. Yep. And um, and it's also the booking agent for Snoop Dogg. So yes. that's how, yeah, that's how we got connected. <laughs> yeah. So this is important. You mentioned Snoop Dogg and that's where we're going next. So Snoop Dogg comes out with this uh, event tour, right? And it's, uh, you know, I want to thank me and you get to be a part of that. So talk a little bit about, I mean, one, just, I mean, being with someone that's as you know notorious as you know Snoop is, and uh, just talk a little bit about your experience there. Yeah, well, first and foremost, uh, it was so surreal once again because I always been a huge fan of Snoop. That's like yeah. pretty much my number one artist that I listened to in high school. So I actually had met him already in Hollywood, like maybe about six years, you know, five okay. years from past from this event, but. Um, but never actually got to work with him officially. So when uh, the opportunity presented itself and, and Bobby D and I and Patty had a meeting because um, apparently one of their publicists wasn't working out. So, you know, um, they were like, you know what, we need somebody else and, uh, and we have something, you know, coming up. And so we need, we need you to come and meet with us and see what we can do. Yeah. So we have the meeting and then, you know, Bobby's like, yeah, of course, you know, let's just, let's just do this. And Patty talked very highly of you and she really likes you. So, and I think you guys make a great team together. So why don't you join? And I said, well, yeah, absolutely. Let's do this. So after that meeting, I think, uh, it wasn't the same meeting. I think it was another one, two days later. Um, Bobby D pulled us back, back in a meeting and he was like, well, uh, you know, dog, which Snoop, uh, is, is having, uh, his, you know, his tour coming up for his, I want to thank me album and we need a press conference and this is in November. Right. Yeah. And, and then I go, oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. And I'm thinking, you know, you know, probably December, you know, I didn't even know when the first concert, yeah. was, whatever was going to be. So I'm like, thinking, you know, we have time. And then he goes, oh, no, but it's going to be next week. So, <laughs> and 
And I'm like looking at Patty like, what? And mind you, this is before Thanksgiving, right on, right, right around the corner from Thanksgiving. Yeah. So me and Patty were like, holy smokes. Okay. So we're like, okay, challenge accepted. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, after that, we were like, holy smokes, we're going to have to do all these things. I mean, it was, it was an incredible process, challenging too. Yeah. Um, it was very uh, chaotic because, you know, the, the compound where we had the event was, wasn't half ready. Um, you know, his, uh, one of his man managers too was like, well, if you guys don't have this ready by, you know, by three days from now, dog's not going to do it because he's very uh, particular about things. So he's not going to have, you know, half ass this. And I was like, oh my God. So we're on the, on the phone with companies and key for two, which we think a lot because key four is part of the, you know, of, of Snoop's, um, uh, you know, team as well. Yeah. And he's one of the right hand, right hand people. He helped us so much on getting on the phone with companies to fix the compound and, and you know, put all the necessary stuff that we needed for the, for the event. But we all literally did not get any sleep for those we were like we were like zombies walking through. yeah we were like oh my god so um it was a lot and then there was obviously some people that were kind of like the non-believers you know like oh yeah they're not gonna make it no one's gonna show up like because media outlets go out of town right you know, it's a holiday so it, it you know it was it, it was impossible to pull for a lot of people were like yeah right well that's not gonna happen this is unrealistic what are you guys thinking? Um, and then I said, no, we are going to make this happen. I don't care what happens, if it snows, if it rains. <laughs> we're figuring we're gonna it make out. This happen. We're going to figure it out. And so, yeah, so, uh, we, yeah, me and Patty got to it. And uh, the day of the, uh, the press conference, actually, all the media outlets were even 30 minutes early. We packed the place. Uh, Snoop was super happy actually in a video uh, on a video that I have uh, posted on my Instagram he says that this has been the, the biggest press conference he's ever had since him and Dre went on tour yeah so for him to say that and and you know and to look at you know look at me and, and hug me and say thank you baby girl thank you for everything and wow that was so rewarding like I words cannot express I was like, oh my God, yay. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that has to just, yeah. I mean, raise confidence and yeah, be a huge boost. No doubt about it. Yes, absolutely. That was very rewarding. So talk a little bit about that in your industry, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you would love to say, hey, every person you've ever met and had the opportunity to represent has said, yes, it's worked out flawlessly. How do you handle no's or not right now's, you know, and still just continue to forge forward? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, how I handle no's now is it's an opportunity for me to just to figure it out and, and turn them into yeses. Like, I'm like, oh, okay. That's not okay. Well, that's a challenge now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> challenge accepted. Oh, really? Okay. So yeah. And I have gotten a lot of no's throughout my career, obviously. Absolutely. Like I think we all do. And, um, you know, and we, instead of us getting discouraged from the no's and, you know, the that you cannot do this or you cannot make that. I feel like that, me personally, it, it, it actually turns on a button here in my brain, like, oh, really? Okay, well, no, 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 no. You gotta, you gotta turn this into a yes. How do we turn this into a yes? How do we make this happen? You know, and so I think that's one of the things that kind of separates me from um, other, you know, people and, and publicists because, and I'm not saying I'm the best because, you know, obviously, but I'm, I mean, really you might, be. You, I might be you might be you might be <laughs> you know there's a lot of great um uh you know people out there but i'm yeah. saying for me it's just it it has put me in a category of of really separating myself from everybody else because i really feel like when somebody says no to me it's just turns automatically into i'm gonna make this happen and i'm gonna yeah. do this like somebody told me i couldn't be in force a lot of people told me you're you can't write they're like laughed at me and they're like huh that's cute. And now so, I'm both in the general print. <laughs> yeah. So how did that come about? I'd love to hear that story. So, yeah. So that came about because I started developing relationships with a lot of journalists along yeah. the way. As a publicist, that's exactly what you do. Right. But I never actually thought about myself. You yeah. Know? I always branded everybody else, but never myself. And yep. 
it wasn't until, until a journalist, a good friend of mine told me, you have an incredible story. What do you mean? Like, we need to get it out there. Like, yeah, you enter a lot of young women and, you know, you're a role model in your community. What do you mean? Like, you need to get it out. And to me, it was just ludicrous because I was like, wait, I'm the publicist, not the, <laughs> not the other way around. But, um, you know, but what, when I understood that I, that I had a purpose and it was so vital and important for me to share my story, um, it finally clicked. I was like, yeah, I need to, I need to do this. <laughs> Absolutely. By the way, Barbara didn't tell you this, but uh, she's going to hire me to be her publicist. So, uh, you know, that'll be yeah. a new thing that I'll be working on soon. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So any inquiries, please. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll do the vetting process of this. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned Omar earlier in our conversation, you know, you said, Hey, I've been friends with him, but you also had referenced at one point that that was one of the first times that you were able to learn a lot about the red carpet experience, right? Because it's different. It's a little bit of a different experience. So talk about that, you know, how that came to be, but then also what you learned from that experience. Yeah, actually, yeah, absolutely. So uh, with Eric Sully at the, at the moment, that's how I learned the red carpet game because he was the king of red carpets, red yeah. carpet this, red carpet that. And I was like, okay, Eric. So uh, <laughs> so we put a lot of events together, me and him. And yeah. um, he had, I was actually hosting them and interviewing people too. So um, I got to learn the dynamics of of how to run it properly because uh, it's not just having the red carpet and, and the backdrop, you know, what we call the step right. and repeat. It's not just that. There's so much more that goes into behind the scenes, you know, like you have to slay people with the whiteboard, let, you know, write their names, let the media know who they are, um, you know, have the media be there on time, yeah. uh, then collect the after, after, you know, interviews, the press, the next day you have to go in online and get every, you know, all the press for your clients and all the people that attended, the pictures from Getty Images. I mean, it's just a lot. And then contacting all those media outlets, it's, it's a lot of work because you have to yeah. be, you know, going back and forth. They ask you a lot of, um, a lot of questions, a lot of requirements prior. Whew, so it's a lot. And then and then obviously the setup, you know, how it's going to make sense for the media outlets that are going to interview and the photographers, you know, to be divided in a space where they're not going to be stepping all over each other and fighting against each other because it's happened before. So you have to kind of, you know, be the peacemaker and be like, yeah. oh, you guys are going to be here, you guys, because, you know, some of the outlets want to get the exclusive. So they want to be in the front and then some of them are mad because they're on the back and so and what, you know, this is talking about medium-sized red carpets, but when you have a movie premiere or when you have, you know, those caliber of events, that's a whole different ballgame. I mean, right. it's massive, massive, like it's just super massive. Or, yeah. you know, a war show, that's, that's completely something else. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and this is not necessarily the cherry on top of things, but I thought it was fascinating that you've been on the... Uh, Steve Harvey show. How the heck did that come to be? That's a pretty <laughs> cool thing. Not many people can say they've been on the Steve Harvey show. That was super. Oh my God. That was super amazing. Thanks to my good friend, Andrea Ward. She's uh, one of my mentees too. And a good friend of mine. I love her to death, but she was dating this guy that we didn't like. Right. And uh, you know, I think it was her mom or somebody that pitched the idea to Steve and they were like, Hey, Steve, you know, can you help us? Because my daughter <laughs> is dating this guy, we don't like him. And at that moment he had a segment on, you know, helping young women to get out of this, you know, relationships yeah. or toxic people, you know, getting away from that. So they actually, um, I think they um, accepted the idea. They were like, they reached out to us and they were like, Hey, yeah, this will be great. <laughs> And so we went into kind of like an intervention, you know, um, yeah. it was like, you know, her closest friend, which was me and Thomas at the time, and then her brother and her mom, uh, Steve invited us to the show. And so we got to, you know, talk to Steve to convince Andrea to leave this man for good. <laughs> Yeah, that that's some of those moments where you're like, thank goodness I never dated a girl that had power like that, right? Or connections. Oh my god, yes, yes. So it was it was so cool to be on the show, to meet Steve in real life, and uh, you know the experience of it all. It was just it was super amazing. I mean, you you get to see the behind the scenes, how they 
work everything, you know, the audience, like how they feed off of, off of that. I mean, it's just incredible. It was an incredible experience. <laughs> Absolutely. So Barbara, there's a question I like to ask everyone that uh, I get the opportunity to be with. And for me, uh, it was something that just a few years ago, a mentor kind of educated me on in the phrase is blissful dissatisfaction. And so the idea is some people in their life, they hit their first goal and then they plateau because it's like, Hey, I hit my goal. Like I'm good. I'm just, I just need to stay here. Then there's people like yourself and myself, I would throw us in this other category. And that is we're constantly trying for the next thing. So it's like, all right, I hit this goal, but now what, what, what's next. And so, you know, there's problems with both ends of the spectrum, but how for you, do you balance that? How do you take you know, confidence and excitement from hitting a goal, but not let that completely fulfill you. So you don't have any, you know, desire, ambition to get to the next one. Right. That's an excellent question. Um, I feel like I'm going to use this analogy because now I'm getting into the fitness world mm-hmm. and uh, shout outs to my, my trainer. He is who he's amazing. Mark Jenkins is amazing. Uh, so when I met Mark, I met him through clubhouse, which a lot of, a lot yeah. of us met through that, through that yeah. app. Thank God. <laughs> um, so I'm going to use this analogy that he actually taught me because it's so true. So when I started working out, um, he said to me, the body responds better when you surprise it and when you don't know what's coming. Mm. Instead of a lot of people work out and they have the same routines, the same nutrition, the same stuff. So your body already knows what, you know, what's coming. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but when you actually work out and, you, and the body doesn't know what's coming, changes thing to happen like you know more and you get better results so I was like it's the same thing in my career it has been like that you know yeah. I always surprise myself with situations or you know I kind of like it's not that I hide it from me obviously but like <laughs> let me put this over here so Barbara doesn't know <laughs> but I like to change it up I like to uh get into new projects and even things that I'm not very familiar with uh, or that I feel like it's a challenge, you know, like, for example, the, the art world, you know, it's yeah. just art, you know, I, I, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of art, but I don't know much about it. Right. Uh, yep. So, but I'm a big fan of, uh, which I just met Shepard Ferry, uh, the owner of the Bay Giant. And that was, oh my God, that was so surreal too. Cause I've been a huge fan of, of Shepard for like so many, so many years. Yeah. And I seen this artwork everywhere. I mean, this guy is worldwide. So, you know, it's amazing. So, uh, but we you know I had the opportunity to meet him through Mark. So, um, but to answer your question, you know, um, I, I was like, oh, wow. I was reading it. He sent me his book and I've been reading it. And, uh, and Mark has a book too. And I've been reading his and I was like, wow, like the, the whole like working out situation, the whole fitness world and the art world are things that are very foreign to me. Yeah. Where? And I'm going to say where, because now I'm getting familiar with them, but it's a challenge, right? Yeah. It's intimidating because you're like, whoa, I'm talking to Shepard. Like, oh my God, he's so knowledgeable because he's also an, he's also an activist, you know? So it's yeah. like, wow, like I'm talking to him. Oh my God. Like, what do I say? Do I say this? Ah, you know? So it's just still kind of like intimidating at some point because you're talking to legendary people here, even with right. Mark, because he's worked with so many, um, you know, A-listers too. So it's like, wow, you know, you, you get the experience to meet this, this, this amazing individuals. And I feel like part of the formula is to still surround yourself with people that have done it already, that had mm. been there already. Yeah. And, and kind of dive in into the uncomfortable, into the, what makes you uncomfortable. Like you just don't want to go there because you're so comfortable with what, what you're doing already. But when you discover another industry, it's like, oh, okay, well, let me, let me look into, let me peek into that. You know, even for Clubhouse, because I feel like sometimes, you know, Clubhouse makes you feel like you're not that knowledgeable. You're right. not, you know, there's a lot of people there that know how to talk. Yeah. Right? So you feel like you're not as intelligent or as articulate. You're like, ooh, yeah. damn, like, I'm just going to be quiet. Like, you just feel small on Clubhouse. You're like, oh, my God, they speak so well. <laughs> does the, the type of uncomfortableness I'm yeah. talking about. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, I appreciate the heck out of you sharing your story today. It's been absolutely fascinating. As I promised everyone, it would be. Um, but no, thanks so much again for being on today. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And I apologize for risking. <laughs> it's all like, good. Oh my God, it was so crazy. And then I was like, okay. Um, and you know, that's another thing that I learned. Sometimes I have to like, kind of like pace myself 
and, and take the time because then I keep saying yes to everything. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And I'm like, wait, hold on, Barbara. <laughs> only so much time, right? Yes, only so much time. But thank you so much for having me, Phil. You have been amazing. Uh, this interview has been one of the best so far. You actually did a lot of research. And I was like, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. 